gender. <laughs> I hardly know her. Just kidding. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. My name is E. As in like escaping the building after having stolen all of the gender in the world, actually. And today, you guessed it, we are continuing our discussion about Genshin Impact's underappreciated representation in the game. Today's topic is one that is simple, easy to understand, not convoluted at all. And it's not something that keeps me up at night. Gender. Woo. <laughs> This isn't gonna give me a headache or send me into a crisis at all. <laughs> Woo! So, you might be asking right now, E, gender in Genshin? I mean, yeah, we have the waifus and the husbandos, what more do you want? And I answer back, please don't speak to me in that tone, it makes me emotional. And also, that was kind of cringe of you to say. So, just as I like to do with this queer representation series, I get into the crevices of the game, look at the lore and go, and then hop on here and share it with you all. Today, I argue that Genshin Impact has several instances of characters being gender queer coded and that these interpretations of our favorite characters are actually quite valid. So I need to make this clear that the purpose of this video is to look at certain characters through a gender queer lens to see how valid or invalid some of those interpretations may be. These are my interpretations and my thoughts. I'm not trying to spread the queer agenda, but this convo is actually quite the rich one if you throw your discrimination out the, out the door for a bit. So let me know your opinions in the comments below as always. And as always, before we begin, please make sure to like and subscribe so that YouTube lets me live another day. <laughs> Thanks, my family's being held hostage. And yes, I was gone for like over a month visiting family, but now I'm back. Hi, and I'm pink. Also for an amazing community, join us on twitch.tv forward slash esocial. And now without any further ado, join me as we discuss the gender queer nature of Genshin Impact. Part one. <laughs> what are we talking about? So as is custom with these beautiful series, I need to make sure we are on the same page. What? is gender? What is gender expression? What does gender queer mean? Why did I leave your mother on red? All very good questions that we will get to shortly. And by shortly, I mean, um, right now. First, we are talking about coding again. Queer coding, if you will. If you are a regular on this channel, you should know what coding and queer coding means. I've said it like so many times, like three times. So you should be able to recite the definition right now. Do it right now. <laughs> Good job! <laughs> Engaging in Dora the Explorer roleplay, apparently. Okay, for everyone who is new, hello, how are you? Queer coding is the act of using subtle hints and nudges, reading in between the lines in a body of work to subtly convey to an audience that a character is in fact queer. Coding happens primarily due to the fact that the piece of media exists in a culture or time period where being queer is not okay. So they do this to avoid censorship. If you want to understand why this part of the definition is so important to Hoyoverse and their climate in China, then please watch both parts to the Genshin is Gay series I spell it out there. The eye icon has it on the screen right there. Go watch it after this video. But TLDR, being gay is a big no-no. Hoyoverse has a past of canonizing queer couples and there is a lot of undeniable coding happening in Genshin. Argue with a wall. Okay, now that that is out of the way, let's get on to the new terms. What is gender? Is something I literally typed into Google and did it in all caps because I was very distressed. <laughs> so one thing that we're going to make crystal clear right here and right now, gender and S E X, which I will now refer to as Yudel <laughs> from now on, just to make sure YouTube doesn't kill me. Gender and Yudel, 
two different things, okay? People are under the impression that gender and util are the same things and that both are clear cut. You're either born a female or a male, it's all in your chromosomes. Well, truth is, util can also be just as complicated as gender. Some people are born with a combination of chromosomes that don't fit into the male and female categories, and others are born with a combination of genitals, and so on and so forth. We can be here all day, but I don't want to get too into it. Bottom line, the human race is vast and gorgeous. We are all so different, yet so alike. Just accept that there are people who are different from you and maybe, maybe we will know peace. So bottom line, gender and util, different. Now, gender. To get this clear cut into a definition, humanrightscampaign.org says this. Gender identity is one's innermost concept of self as male, female, or blend of both or neither, how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. One's gender identity can be the same or different from their util. <laughs> I am 23 years old. From their util assigned at birth. Gender expression is how you express that identity. External expression of one's gender identity, usually expressed through behavior, clothing, body characteristics, or voice, and which may or may not conform to socially defined behaviors and characteristics typically associated with being either masculine or feminine. Hey, oh. Uh Hey, wait, are you still with me? I know this is a lot, but also I feel like we should be on the same page with these terms and I get confused between the terms sometimes. So it's not gonna hurt anybody to spell them out. Okay, so stick with me, all right? Walk with me, walk with me. Gender is a concept that one finds out as they grow. How they express that gender should not fit into any categories, but is very influenced by the culture that the person is raised in. Now, another term that I will be using in this video is gender non-conforming. Gender non-conforming means, as slrp.org states, refers to people who do not follow other people's ideas or stereotypes about how they should look or act based on the female or male util <laughs> they were assigned at birth. So. For example, a man who is born a male who identifies as male, but who wears feminine stuff and acts or behaves overtly feminine or does or have interest in things that are different from what society says dudes should be interested in would be gender non-conforming or DNC, like the vitamin sports drinks. Bigger be gonna go drink my gender non-conforming juice. Okay, gender queer, which is another term that I'll be using a lot in this video, is, as Cambridge Dictionary puts it, having a gender identity that is not simply male or female, or experiencing gender in a way that is different from the way society expects you to. A lot of different terms fall under gender queer. It's a nice umbrella term. So, okay. Are these insanely complicated concepts and terms that have a numerous amount of research and academic papers behind them, which I just consolidated into a page and a half of writing? Yes. But we are talking about Genshin Impact, so <laughs> this is more than enough to explain my thoughts behind these characters. So after all of this, um, how does this relate to Genshin Impact? Well, I love to break it to you, but we got some gender queer coding in some of these here characters. Also, if my eyes look a little red, it's because I'm coughing, because I'm sick. I swear to God, I did not get zooted before filming. Let's talk about Venti. Hey girl, I like Venti a normal amount. Venti, I don't have to make a huge campaign for because look at him, <laughs> look at the guy. <laughs> His pronouns are little lad and I Love that for him. Okay, to be serious. In his lore, before gaining his divinity, he is described as such. He, who would in later days be known as Barbados, was but a tiny elemental spirit without a shred of divine dignity, a breeze that brought subtle changes for the better, or tiny seeds of hope. Being an elemental spirit of the wind, something that is the essence of freedom and changeability, is not a concept constrained by gender. I argue that in this state, Venti as an elemental spirit was genderless, or let's just say genderqueer, identifying as something outside the realm of the binary. He only took on the appearance that we know of him today to mimic his friend who died in the revolution to overthrow Decab... Decab... 
<laughs> he only took on the appearance that we know of him today to mimic his friend who died in the revolution to overthrow Decabrian, the god of storms. It states in his character story 4 that after Decabrian was overthrown and with Venti obtaining his divinity, his first use of this power was to reconstitute himself in the likeness of that young lad. For only if he wore human shape could he play the lyre that the lad so loved. Venti now walks the land of Tevat as a bard, intervening with the affairs of Mondstadt less than often for he is the god of freedom, never one to be constrained or ask to constrain others. So as we read, Venti simply took this form of the boy to be able to honor his friend and to be able to play the liar. This act did not seem to be informed by expressing his identity as a new god or to express his gender identity for that matter. It was to simply honor a friend and well, play the liar. This choice to be this lad is one he chose to do, which is refreshing to see in a game like Genshin Impact. To have a character, a god, no less, take up a new identity that isn't really concerned on appearances or informed by societal expectations of gender, but to take on an identity that surpasses all of those frivolous signifiers and just be. It's very apt and poetic for the god of freedom, the animal archon, to be free to his very core. He goes where he pleases, he drinks as much as he pleases, and he takes the form of what he pleases. To be free is to be like the wind, ever changing changing, ever moving, never constrained. Constrained not by what a lad should look like or what a lass should look like, but to just be. And that is so beautiful. Appearance wise and how they showcase this freedom in this character is also very well done in my opinion. You kind of look at the guy and go, huh? What are you? <laughs> I definitely thought Venti was a girl when I first saw him, and many, many do. As that one fateful Beijing game conference document leaks point out, which I talked more about in my other videos, again, go watch those, Chinese video game companies were told to avoid making overtly feminine men, with Venti Genshin Impact being an example of what not to do. <laughs> it girl behavior, if you ask me. He is very androgynous with his braided hair, slender build, and pretty features. He does wear boyish shorts and attire, but overall he is very ambiguous, which again reinforces the carefree nature of how he expresses his identity, which mirrors the motif of being free as the wind. His Archon form does not help any as well, for it is so darn skippy and so feminine. He wears like booty shorts and a crop top, makes the onlooker 10 times more confused, but he's having his hot girl summer, so just leave him alone. But regardless of what exactly his gender identity may or may not be and the crisis he inflicts upon my psyche, bro is slaying that much. I could say with certainty. Overall, I find his presentation and toying of gender expression and his origins of just being the f***ing wind to be very gender queer coded of him. I think viewing and understanding and interpreting his character as being gender queer is a more than valid way of interpreting him that goes beyond just observing his outward appearance, but understanding who he is as an entity. I don't really want to say this means he is gender fluid or he is non-binary or anything else because I don't know, it isn't really my place and not the point. The point is, is that he doesn't seem to conform to typical practices of the binary. So huzzah, I have deemed him genderqueer. <laughs> Any questions? No? On to the next one then. <laughs> his little lad hat fell off. Oh, look at him. He's so cute. I'm gonna bite his head off. Okay. Okay, so what is the opposite of the wind? <laughs> a fucking rock. It is interesting to pair Jean-Louis or Rex Lapis right after Venti in this gender queer discussion, but there is a discussion to be had with him. Rex Lapis is the prime adepti or head 
of the adept eye will usually take the form of an illuminated beast. If you are a pure-blooded adept eye, you can change your form at will like Madame Ping or Xiao, but others choose to stay in their OG beast form. Zhang Li's form that he takes for formal events such as the Rite of Dissension is a half dragon, half Lin or Qilin form. This is the form we see dead as a doornail on the concrete floor at the beginning of the Liyue Ar Conquest. Whether or not this is his true form, girl, well, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. I only say this because in the web event, Stone Harbor Treasure Journal, Zhang Li seems to hint at his true form, but doesn't say what it is. Though this is a web event and not from within the bowels of the Genshin lore, but it is interesting to consider that maybe the Exuvia is in his true form. But anyways, regardless, Zhang Li, or Rex Lapis, is known to take different forms from different times. I personally view the Adepti as along the same lines as as the elemental wind spirit venti is due to the fact that they are both elevated beings that exist in more natural forms and that don't seem to pay too much attention to mortal signifiers like what gender you should be dressing or expressing as. That point aside, I want us to look at the novel series Rex Incognito to see the extent to Zhang Li's past of shapeshifting and playing with gender. So if you look up antonyms to the word clear. Rex Incognito's popping up, girl. This series of texts found around Tevat is far from being crystal clear and is a little bit confusing. <laughs> I had to read it a few times, so by saying that, I highly recommend reading it for yourself. The link is in the description if you are ever so inclined. I'm going to try to explain what I took away from it. So Rex Incognito is a fantasy novel from Liyue where some author wrote about his Rex Lapis fan fiction, pretty much. It is based on uncommon Liyue folklore and rumors surrounding Rex Lapis, but it is 100% an unreliable narrator, okay? I wanna get that clear right here, right now, okay? Cause I know someone is in the comments already going, well, actually, so hold on, hold on, all right, hold on. Is this book factual? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Not entirely, at least. I will explain my reasoning, why it's still valid to look towards it for this video in a second. So just sit tight, okay? So the book tells the story of a man calling out a merchant for her fake jade plaque that she is selling in her store. He is described as youthful with amber eyes. So it's implied to be Zhongli. To rebuttal his accusation, she then tells him a fake story of how the plaque came to be, wherein Rex Lapis came down in the form of a woman and asked a jade cutter to make a plaque resemble that of the true form of Rex Lapis. The jade cutter then made the jade reflect the woman that was in front of him. She thought this was interesting and then told him some random story about Rex Lapis in the form of a fisherman, but that's uh, that's not important right now. Regardless, in the very end, Zhang Li makes fun of the merchant for her made up tale, but he buys the plaque anyways. He stated that there are plenty of rumors that Rex Lapis would often take the form of a woman, but there's just no concrete evidence. That is just the TLDR version of the novel. So the author wrote, that at some point in time, it was theorized that Rex Lapis would adorn a female vessel. In the Fleeting Colors in Flight event, we were able to ask Zhang Li about his opinions on this novel. And he says this, gods and adepti are far removed from the mortal experience. That they are difficult to portray in writing is no surprise. It is true that the Geo Archon Morax would journey in the mortal realm from time to time, but there was not quite so much ostentatious shape shifting as the books would have have you believe. When the goal is to wander the streets undetected, donning an overly elaborate disguise is somewhat self-defeating. So, hey, <laughs> Shang Li, what the fuck does ostentatious mean, you old man? I had to look this one up to clear up my own confusion, but it means this. Characterized by vulgar or pretentious display, designed to impress or attract notice. So this means that one, it is a popular rumor that Zhang Li would go as a woman sometimes. Two, Zhang Li admits he shapeshifts, but not so obviously and gaudily. He did not say, Psh, I never went as a woman. I never had tits. He just disputes the silly thought that he would dress in a way that attracts attention since that's the last thing he wants while going incognito. <laughs> Rex incognito, if you will. 
Okay. Though the book is fiction, it did bring forth those two important talking points before. Whether or not he ever was a woman is a bit vague, but regardless, the air of rumor surrounding the toying of gender with this character, the act of writing it into the game for us to find, and then having Zhang Li directly react to it is a very interesting choice to say the least. Paired with Zhang Li's statement of the gods and Adepti being difficult to put into writing for how removed they are, tells me that my earlier assumption of gender and gender expression that we know it as today, and that is so fragile and easy to redefine as mortals go through history, it's not something the gods or adepti adhere to since they are far removed from the mortal experience. Placing the subtle hinting of Zhang Li's changeability, shapeshiftability, and fluidness of presentation just tells me that a genderqueer understanding of his character is welcomed, and again, more than valid. I think this reading is a valid one for all divine beings that can shapeshift, which would include the rest of the pure-blooded adepti. And you know what? That's not me saying, hey, everyone, is genderqueer, woohoo, the liberal agenda in video games. I'm not saying that, so please don't go to the extreme of that, but I am broadening up this interpretation because it honestly shouldn't be that big of a deal. Having a non-human creature not adhere to human practices just makes sense to me. The thing I really like about Genshin's queer coding is that queer people existing are hinted at, but not made a huge deal, which is mostly because of the censorship, but you know, it makes it seem just more natural because real life queer and gender queer people just, you know, exist like that. Me calling Zhang Li, Rex Lapis, a gender queer being shouldn't knock the socks off of anyone. It's just an observation with how Hoyaverse decided to present and showcase Rex Lapis as a divine being. It is also very sick to view shapeshifters just as inherently gender queer because they give a sort of tangible, albeit fictional, example of being able to truly take your gender into your own hands and be able to present exactly how you see and view yourself as. Through shapeshifters, genderqueer people can feel a sense of freedom that they themselves might be limited to by being, well, a human person. Because <laughs> if I had it my way, girl, I'd look like this. Enough with the divine being, okay? Let's talk about some mortals or kind of mortals. I don't actually know. Uh, okay, next section. Gosh, okay. I have been waiting for this one. This one's my favorite. This video was mostly inspired by this next person and Venti because I love Venti, but like no one could tell obviously that I like Venti, I mean, who can tell that? I never talk about Venti, but anyway. So who is that next person? Of course, father herself, Arlecchino, the nay, the woman of my dreams, please. Call me back, Arlecchino. The children miss you. Arlecchino, one of the Fatui Harbingers, is one of the most interesting characters and hottest in the game that toy with gender and gender expression. And because of her, I know a lot about Venetian mask making now for some reason. Pandemi 2.0, watch me rock in the Arlecchino stage mask while I go to the market and look at all the food I can't buy because everything is so expensive. <laughs> Okay, Arlecchino, also known as the Knave, is the director of the orphanage called the House of the Hearth. This House of the Hearth was originally made or led by the previous Knave, who our current Arlecchino overthrew because she was a total bitch. As the current head of the orphanage, she is referred to as father by the children in it. As we hear in Linny, Lynette and Fremine say like all the time. We are going to go into the meaning of her many titles in a second, since I think they are the most interesting part of this discussion, but let's talk about her appearance first. When we first saw her in the Futui trailer, before hearing her voice, she seemed very androgynous from the get-go. At first glance, she had short hair and a large coat covering her main attire, not giving us a whole lot to go on. Genshin Impact has quite the reputation for hyper feminine characters, but, I would argue Arlecchino is one of the most masculine leading character designs in the game. Cause yeah, she wears pants. Like three women wear pants. It's kind of a big deal for Genshin. <laughs> it's so silly, but 
it's what we're working with, okay? I see her outfit to be the pinnacle of the sort of gender non-conforming atmosphere that her character entails. She essentially wears a suit with a tailcoat, a garment worn by men back in the ye olden days of France that Fontaine is inspired by. She has what looks to be something that represents a tie and a popped up collar. This traditionally masculine outfit is paired with some traditionally feminine traits. High heels so sharp they are most certainly a weapon, long elegant fingernails, and a long ponytail in the back. It's a design that combines both masculine and feminine traits, which leads us to the next portion of her character, her names. First off, okay, what does the knave mean? This is one of her titles she inherited when taking the seat among the Fatui Harbingers. Knave has several meanings in its long etymological past. <laughs> the most common in different settings and interpretations are these, young boy, servant boy, peasant lad. And other definitions say a knave is just like the worst, a dishonest, unprincipled man who is more roguelike than anything. And Merriam-Webster says a knave is a tricky, deceitful fellow, which I am absolutely obsessed with, okay? Among all of these definitions though, they are all masculine, denoting a lad, a tricky fellow, or a boy. The Chinese characters for the knave, as shown here, translate directly to servant, which matches the English definitions, but seems to lack a sense of gender along with it. Through one of my sources, which is one of my friends, Hi. I was told that the second character right here straight up just means person in Chinese, which is just not gendered. Though I am not an expert in the connotations behind Chinese translations. So if anyone wants to shed some light on any gender happening in this word, please let me know in the comments. Okay, thanks. Both the title being seen as masculine or genderless both add to my point, which I will wrap together in a moment. Now, the meaning of knave partnered with Arlecchino is where the fun comes in. Yup, I got to read all about the Camino del Arte and I love it. And I love it. I do not think this is groundbreaking information that all of the Fatui Harbingers are named after stock characters from the Italian playmaking of Camino del Arte, right? Like we all know this, but even if you didn't, now you do. But what we may not know is what each character was known for or what they usually were up to and characterized by in the Italian theater. The Arlecchino is also known as the Harlequin in English and was a form of Zani or Zany. I don't know. But we do get the word Zany from this character. Fun fact. Zany characters are usually just different iterations of the broke ass dumb fuck that would be hilarious in their stupidity yet have spontaneous geniusness at times. I identify as a Zany personally because I do have spouts of sounding pretty cool here on youtube.gov. Then you look at my Twitter and I'm talking about American Airlines ball sacks and you're like, <laughs> what's happening? But you know, I digress. The Arlecchino often wore masks such as these when the actors donned the character and would follow similar story progressions by being a broke, valet, servant dude, always getting into difficult situations and would betray others to get what he needed to get done. He often was intertwined with the female character Columbina where they would usually have a love story together or sometimes be best friends. I'm going to stare very deeply into the camera right now and make you uncomfortable because do I need to explain why that is an interesting point to make. This description of the Arlecchino being ready to portray at a moment's notice matches with how Child describes her in his voice line, how she would betray even the Saritza if it would work out for her. The most important aspect of all of this is that the Arlecchino is always shown to be a male character and there does exist a separate character by the name of Arlecchina who is a woman. This is not like a gender bent version of the male Arlecchino. It is a whole separate person. The metmuseum.org stated that Arlecchino's paramour or lover is usually Columbina or Arlecchina, who was a clever maid servant. So when Hoya was cooking up this character, if they liked the name Arlecchino, they had plenty of lore to still call her Arlecchina, but they purposely decided to play around with these multiple masculine titles. Additionally, Italian is a very gendered language. So even without positioning the Arlecchino within the Camino del Art, it is still an inherently masculine word. So in reflection, she is referred to as Arlecchino 
masculine, the knave, masculine or genderless, and as father by the children of the hearth. Hmm. 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 Yes, she did adopt all of these titles when she replaced the previous owner of these titles, but they are still her names in the game. Plus, the previous owner of these names was also a woman. So these names paired with her seemingly dance with both feminine and masculine traits and at times androgynous appearance gives me the biggest impression that she is genderqueer or gender non-conforming. With the use of her masculine titles and feminine pronouns, she is coded in such a way that at her very essence, she is challenging typical binary ideals of what is masculine and what is feminine. She is not strictly overtly this or or that. She plays with things that we consider are for typically masculine or feminine people and makes it her own. It's done with purpose, if I may be so bold to say. She can be all or none at all. And all of this just seems very purposeful when put together. They had the option to call her mother in the hearth. They also could have made her code name Arlequina since that character does exist and is also a servant while being very clever. The fact that they didn't proves to me that yes, viewing Arlequino as gender non-conforming or genderqueer is again very valid and slayful. Let's go gender non-conforming Arlequino, yes! I love you so much, please call me back and kill someone on screen and be a little more evil at some point, I, I'm begging you. Was going to talk about Goro and Miss Hina in this video because that was suggested to me by my amazing Twitch chat, twitch.tv forward slash eosocial, but I think I'm going to save that discussion for queer coding part three since there's more to talk about with Ito and Miss Hina rather than Goro himself identifying as Miss Hina since he doesn't seem to. So if you're wondering why that isn't in this video, that's my thought process why. Also, I think the conversation surrounding Albedo and his existence as a homunculus it leaves more room for more gender discussion. So share any thoughts you may have about our favorite alchemist in the comments below. The pointing out of the Melazine's pronouns by Monsieur Nouvellet was also just very cool to do. It was a small mention, but just spoke volumes for how important it is to respect someone's pronouns. So important that Monsieur Nouvellet put it into the law. Also more androgynous characters like Xingqiu and Lenny's femininity was touched on more in my queer coding videos, so definitely go watch that. But it should also be noted that they exist, which is dope. <laughs> and just to cover all my bases, I did do a whole video discussing Wanderer's journey with gender and how his story can be viewed as an allegory for the trans journey. So if you want to talk about Wanderer, the video is linked below and also in the little eye icon right there. I say that in case you're wondering why so-and-so wasn't talked about. It's either because I already talked about them or they will soon be talked about in a different context, so. In conclusion, as I touched on with my opening definition, gender is one that has many different meanings and gender expression can range from time periods and cultures and does not need to be so constrained. The toying of it in these three characters that I pointed out in a game like Genshin Impact is sick as sh <laughs> There is a lot of coding and hints to be taken that other interpretations of these characters seems to be more than a little valid. And the way they are are presented to is just in a natural free way. People will identify as things that you or I may not be familiar with, but they aren't going around yelling at everyone how they identify, they just are. Your gender expression can be anything that feels the most correct for you. The lore of Genshin Impact is just so rich and delicious that it would be a crime and a bit narrow-minded to constrain this vast lore into only viewing it from a black and white perspective. So whether or not you agree with me and my findings and interpretations, I still believe that the fact that we are able to pick apart the lore in this way and that the characters are this deep and complex is something that we should celebrate. Genshin has its faults, absolutely, but to give credit where credit is due, they know how to whip up a good f***ing <laughs> character, dude. I wish the same sense of self that flows with the winds of Mondstadt onto you and your life. However you may identify as, may it be as free and without burden as the breeze that carries the songs of history. 
Okay, that last line was a little cheesy, but it's one of the reasons why I love Venti so much. I think I just want the same air he has about him for me as well. Having Venti as a character in my life has brought a lot of understanding to myself for how I identify and also a lot more questions to be honest and also just a lot of self-love. You know, representation is beautiful and important. And I love talking about it here with you guys and this game that I love. Anyways, I really hope you liked the video. And if you did, please make sure to like and subscribe because I want to live and YouTube has a gun to my head. So if you'd be so kind. I make Genshin Impact discussion videos as well as overall fandom discussions, which I'll be making more of in the future. So why don't you join us? Also to hang out some more and talk about these kind of topics together, join us over on twitch.tv forward slash ESocial and join our Discord, which is in the description. If you want to help support the channel some more and to help me continue making these really fun videos, then why don't you consider becoming a member? Also follow me on all of my socials if you want to get even more acquainted. And with that, if I do not see you on Twitch, then I shall see you in the next one. Why am I doing that? Okay, bye, 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 bye. Fifty thousand likes on the video, and I will set him on fire.